All right, Explorer. It's that part of the week where we escape planet Earth just for a little bit and see what is lurking across the solar system and beyond. Strap in, it's a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Welcome along, my name's Dan, this is our club of explorers where we search out all of the science secrets lurking around this week in our battle to discover the greatest part of science that we love but find out why studying wasps could be the best science of all. Wasps are nature's pest controllers. They eat and hunt all the other kind of insects and arthropods that you might even dislike as much as you dislike wasps. Things like spiders and flies and worms and things that get in your drinks in the summer. Also, we'll hear what happens to stars when they die. A star such as our own, like our sun, reaches the end of its life. It's run out of fuel to burn, to fuse together, and so it starts stripping off its outer layers into a planetary nebula, and you're left behind with this quite cool core of the star. And you can hear about a huge surge of energy from the sky. Stick around, it's a brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. Let's kick things off with your science in the news. You might remember this story from last year when a famous old tree was mysteriously cut down in the north of England. And people loved that tree. It was ancient, it was iconic, and it was seen as a brutal act. But there might be some good news. New life has sprung from the rescued seeds and twigs of the Sycamore Gap tree, giving hope that this iconic tree has a future. Just a stump is now left. If it is healthy, a new tree could eventually grow there, which is good news. As people try and figure out what actually happened to the old one, we can at least be calm that something new might pop up. Also, a SpaceX crew of three US astronauts and one Russian cosmonaut have successfully arrived on board the International Space Station. The Endeavour spacecraft docked with the ISS after blasting off from Florida. The Crew 8 mission will be there for six months. And in that time, more than 200 science experiments will happen. They will grow artificial replicas of human organs in the low gravity environment. We can't do it here on Earth. It's amazing that they're taking this time out of space to find out the impact that gravity has on the way we grow, on the way us humans form. I love that with everything going on, Scientists, we still find ways to work together to push boundaries and discover something new. That is brilliant news. And our final story this week, the world's onlyest known fossilised forest has been found in cliffs along southwest England. It was found near Minehead in Somerset, near a holiday camp. Let's find out more with Professor Neil Davies from the University of Cambridge. Neil, thank you for joining us. Just tell us, why were you looking there? Oh, we just wanted to see what the rocks could tell you about the ancient environment 390 million years ago. And then we found the fossils by chance. By chance is such an interesting way of putting it because, you know, you are scientists, you know these things. Are you saying that there was no hint that this might be found if you were to look deeper there? Yeah, people have looked there for over 100 years and no one's ever found any fossil trees or fossil forest there before. So we just stopped for lunch and while having a sandwich, saw some knobbly shapes on the side of the rock and realised that actually that was a, a fossil tree trunk. And then we found more of these trees standing out in the actual cliffs. What happens next then? You're sat there with a little sandwich in your mouth, perhaps, and you see a little knobbly forest. And you, what, what do you do? Do you start digging? Do you let other people know? Run us through that. Well, we didn't dig anything. These are very hard rocks. So it was just a case of taking photos of these, measuring how long the pieces of wood were, how the trees were separated from one each other, and then walking out over the cliffs and finding as many examples as possible. And how wide is this forest? How large is the area? Well, we see them all the way along the coast of Devon and Somerset. So it extends for a good... 100 kilometres or so, but also at the time that these rocks were deposited, Devon and Somerset were attached to Belgium and Germany. So actually, you're talking about a forest that's probably hundreds of kilometres long because there are tree trunks known from those regions as well. And how old are these fossilised tree trunks? So they date to about 390 million years ago. So they're before you have vertebrates on land, so before animals with backbones on land. The only other life on land at the time are small little invertebrate type critters that look like scorpions 
And we were actually discussing quite recently on this podcast about how fossils of dinosaurs are made. I, I wonder if that's different for trees and wildlife and, and, and fauna, a flora. I wonder if you could expand on that. How are fossilised trees made, Neil? So if you look at a lot of younger fossilised trees, they tend to be mineralised. So fluids that contain minerals get inside them and turn them into a different substance. But these very early trees were very different to what we know today. Unfortunately for us, they all had hollow trunks, which meant they could very easily fill with sand. And then the sand left behind a kind of jelly mould type impression inside the middle of these actual fossil tree trunks. What does it change about how much we know about how the UK was back then, almost 400 million years ago? Well, it adds a little bit of colour to what we know because there aren't many rocks of this age in the UK, mostly because this little bit of the UK was attached to continental Europe at the time. And the rest of the area was a mountain range. So things, sediment was being eroded and no no rock was being deposited. So we know now that there were these very early fossil forests from much earlier than we've previously known. The oldest other fossil forest in Britain doesn't come until what's known as the Carboniferous period, which is almost 100 million years later. Well, it's really interesting to try and expand on that, because when we think of places millions and millions of years ago, we think of the dinosaurs. This is tens and tens of millions of years before the dinosaurs would have ever walked the planet. So what what would the world have been like back then? How long were these changes and how slow were they taking between one state of the world to the next millions of years ago, Neil? Okay, so this fossil forest is about 4 million years older than the previous record holder in New York. And the forest in Somerset is really simple. It just has these little trees that look like palm trees from a distance, but rather than leaves, they've got twigs and they have hollow trunks. Just 4 million years later in the New York fossils, you see that there's a fully developed forest with an understory and all kinds of things going on. By the time the New York forest is deposited, you have the first amphibians crawling around on land. So we know that this is a really quick kind of change to the landscape. In the Somerset Forest, it's a a patchy kind of uh, arrangement of a few small spindly trees, uh, no more than two to four metres tall. And then the only things on land are simple invertebrates that look like present day scorpions. And four million years is still a long, long time. Is it a surprise to you that things, because of the forest you found, have been shown to change so quickly in that four million year time? Yeah, it is. It is a very quick time period, geologically speaking. I mean, it's over 100 million years before the first dinosaurs. It's quicker than, say, human evolution over the last four million years that we see this really big rapid change. It just shows you how, although it's very long to our perspective, how in the framework of the, the Earth's history, which is billions of years old, how quickly things can actually change and suddenly in geological history. Really great to chat to you all about this and learn more. Professor Neil Davies from the University of Cambridge, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Let's get to your questions then. Remember, if you ever have anything sciencey that you need answered, ask me because I'll do the digging. I'll search for you and I'll even find some people who are proper geniuses in that field who can sort it for you. The best way that you can get in touch is by leaving a voice note on the free Fun Kids app or at funkidslive.com. You can also send them as a message to me online. That's what Harry's done. Harry wants to know, why does it rain so much in Britain? Well, it does rain quite a bit. If you're out around different countries i know that so many people listen all around the world which is brilliant thank you for doing that i cannot emphasize enough though how drizzly it can get in the uk and it's because of where britain is as an island in the world there are lots of oceans all around the uk and warm air will travel across the atlantic ocean vast stretch of sea to the west and it brings with it a lot of moisture sucks up water from the sea Also, the UK is very hilly with lots of mountains and valleys. And as the warm air travels over the mountains in the UK, it cools down very quickly. It gets higher and that means the moisture inside gets heavy. It gets dense and it can't stay up in the sky for long. So it falls. It rains 
Also, the UK is on the path of the jet stream. You might have heard about that. It's a fast moving, sweeping current of air, which is very high up in the sky. And it makes all the weather around it quite unpredictable. We get what's called low pressure systems. Well, there's air kind of stretched over a long distance and they're all doing different bits. They're all moving around because there's a lot of space for them to move in. So it's always changing and that helps clouds form and storms sweep across the country. And that is why it rains so much in Britain, Harry. A lot of reasons. Thank you for the question. Here is a voice note now, uh, been sent in through the Free Fun Kids app by Aaron. What have you got, Aaron? When white dwarfs die, what do they turn into? Well, Aaron, thank you so much for that question. What happens to white dwarf stars when they die? It's a wonderfully precise question, very particular. Let's find out more with Ed Turner from the National Space Centre. Good friends up there. Ed, thank you for joining us. So let's just start. Uh, What is a white dwarf star? What makes it one? So a white dwarf star is basically what happens when a star such as our own, like our sun, reaches the end of its life. It's run out of fuel to burn, to fuse together, and so it starts stripping off its outer layers into a planetary nebula, and you're left behind with this quite cool core of the star that we call a white dwarf. So we always hear about our sun and its end point might be that it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Is that what's happening with a white dwarf? Is it expanding to such a point by this stage? Yep. So so we usually talk about our sun because our sun is a pretty average star. Most of the stars in our universe are, uh, we call them yellow dwarf stars. There's lots of dwarf stars around in our universe. Our sun is a yellow dwarf star. As it reaches the end of its life, it will start expanding. It will get larger and larger and larger. It will get brighter and brighter and brighter until it reaches what we call the red giant phase. And this is the phase when it's it's pretty much ready to go. It's ready to pop. It's ready to die. And then that is the moment when all of its outer layers uh, get stripped away and you're left just with this white dwarf. So basically a white dwarf comes from a star such as our own when it reaches the end of its life. So we've got our white dwarf star. What happens when it dies? Just talk us through that process. So this is a really, really interesting question in astronomy because the problem is we've never seen what happens what ha- uh, when a white dwarf dies. So if we take our sun, for example, our sun is about midway through its life at the moment. In about 8 billion years, it will reach a white dwarf. It will become a white dwarf. And in about one quadrillion years, so that's one with 15 zeros after it, then that is the point where we consider this white dwarf as being dead. And it reaches this new phase that we call a black dwarf. So a white dwarf, we call them white dwarfs because they look pretty white in our sky. A black dwarf it's called because it's releasing pretty much no light, no heat, no radiation. Um, As I said, we've never seen this happen and we will probably never see this happen because it takes, as far as we know, such a long time to happen that it's all theoretical at the moment. But scientists must have ideas about what happens. I know that there could be a link with black holes as well. So just tell us what experts' best guess is for what happens at this point. So what we think happens um, when it comes to white dwarfs themselves, we know that they are no longer fusing elements together, which is what gives stars their fuel, what helps them burn. And so the only thing that stops a white dwarf from collapsing into a black hole is the stuff it's made of. These things called electrons. Electrons hate each other. They hate being near each other. It's like trying to put the same pole of two magnets together. They will repel each other. That is the only thing that is keeping a white dwarf as a star itself and not collapsing into a black hole. It just doesn't have enough matter or mass to uh, gravity to pull itself into a black hole. So a white dwarf is just basically sat there, releasing this heat, slowly, slowly cooling down. So we know that it must cool down because everything cools down when it is surrounded by cooler stuff. That's the laws of thermodynamics. So we know that these white dwarfs are cooling down. They're slowly, slowly emitting heat, getting colder and colder and colder. And we think, well, there will be a time when they get very, very close to the temperature of the background temperature of space, which is almost at absolute zero. It's about minus 273 degrees. That is the coldest that you can go. 
there'll become a point where this white dwarf star will cool to that point where it has no more heat left to radiate out and it will be left as this well what's quite interesting is we know that stars are made of gas these white dwarfs these black dwarfs they will be solid they'll actually be a bit like a diamond in the sky because it'll be made out of solidified and crystallized carbon which is exactly what a diamond is made out of so imagine a big diamond in the sky that's basically what happens at the end of a white dwarf's life I was always under the impression that black holes were made when some stars died and they collapsed in on themselves. What decides whether a star is going to be a white dwarf, a black dwarf, a black hole? How do we figure that out? It's all about how big it is. So really massive stars are made of lots and lots of matter. There's loads of stuff inside these massive stars. So they have loads and loads of gravity. Now, I talked about how electrons hate each other. They're always repelling away from each other. In massive stars, the force of gravity pushing inwards is more than the pushing of the electrons away from each other, and so it collapses into a black hole. If you talk about a star like our sun, it just simply doesn't have enough gravity to overcome that uh, electron repelling away from each other. Right. So there we go, Aaron. Uh, uh, full history of stars, gajillion years worth. Uh, I hope that's answered your question, mate. Thank you so much, Ed Turner from the National Space Centre. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. For this week's Dangerous Down, where we look at some of the most mean, weird and strange things, we are headed across the universe, outside the solar system, for something odd that gets shot back into it. Cosmic rays sound like something made up, right? If I were say, write a sci-fi movie for me, you'd probably invent the cosmic ray. But they are absolutely real. They are bursts of high-energy particles shot through space at almost the speed of light. They come from black holes, supernova, even from our own sun. Things in the universe that make an incredible amount of energy. Think of it like a beam, a laser beam almost, that scatters across the universe. This incredibly huge surge of energy is a type of radiation, which you might have heard about. Immense pressures, points of energy. And this high burst can cause big problems for the atoms in your body. It can pass through you, messing around with what happens inside you, even changing your DNA if you're in space, that is. Luckily, here on Earth, our atmosphere provides protection against cosmic rays. It dilutes them, it makes them a bit weaker by the time they reach us, so they don't have much impact at all here on Earth. But as humankind, as we travel through space and get further across the solar system, cosmic rays do have the potential to wreak havoc on technology in rockets and space stations. They could even be powerful enough to get through spacesuits and cause dangerous, dangerous problems for astronauts. And that is why the brilliantly sounding cosmic ray goes straight onto our dangerous down list. This week on the Fun Kids Science Weekly, in our battle to find the greatest science to figure out who is first in their field, we're looking at wasps with an entomologist studying one of those very bizarre creatures that a lot of us are unsure about, but I think they have plenty of good with Dr. Sarian Sumner from the University College London. Dr. Sarian, you have one minute to tell us why studying wasps is the best type of science. You start in three, two, one, go! So wasps are definitely the most important thing for all those young budding scientists out there to start start working on because no one likes wasps except a few people, quirky people like me but everyone should love wasps just like you love bees so i'm on a mission to change that and here are the top reasons why you should want to study wasps firstly wasps are nature's pest controllers they eat and hunt all the other kind of insects and arthropods that you might even dislike as much as you dislike wasps things like spiders and flies and worms and things that get in your drinks in the summer they're also decomposers they break down they get rid of all the dead bodies of insects and even animals like dead mice that are left lying around a dead sausage lying on your barbecue they'll get rid of it for you if you let them Wasps are also pollinators, so everybody thinks that bees are the supreme pollinators of the world. And of course, bees are really important pollinators, but wasps are just as important. They visit a huge diversity of, of flowers. Oh, and Sarah, that is your time. That's no your way! That's, that's your official minute. Wow. 
So that y- you've done a brilliant job in fighting the corner for the wasp. I will ask though, why are they so aggressive? Like, why are they plenty of good about them? And I love the assassins. Uh, I love that they are food. I love that they are, uh, are they are nature's vacuum cleaner. But why are they so irritatingly aggressive through summer? Why do they never let us rest, Sarian? Well, I mean, the basic problem is us, not them. <laughs> and it's also only a couple of species that really do come to bother us. So the types of wasps that interface with humans that come and bother us at our picnics are the yellow jacket wasps. And the reason why they do that is only at the end of the summer when the worker wasps are no longer don't have as many uh, larvae to feed in the colony. So they're normally out catching prey, catching insects, catching bits of your sausage, taking it back to the colony, feeding the larvae. But towards the end of the summer, the larvae have started pupating. And once they've, they're pupae, they don't need feeding anymore. So there's less work for the workers. And also, when they're feeding the larvae, the workers get this sugary treat, sugary reward given to them by the larvae as a kind of thank you gesture for delivering this nice bit of caterpillar to me. And obviously, at the end of the summer, there's still hot thousands of workers around per colony, and there isn't as much larval food being provided to them. And so they have to look elsewhere for their food. And adult wasps are actually vegetarian. So they will hunt prey to give to the larvae, but it's the baby larvae that are the carnivores. So the adult wasps are looking for sugar. And normally they'll go and visit flowers. As I said, they're really important pollinators. But in the absence of any flowers or in the presence of your lovely jam sandwich or your sugary drink, they will happily come and bother you and feast on your drink. But they're not after you. They are so, you are a nuisance to them. You are an inconvenience. All they're after is their food. So if a wasp does come to you at your picnic or it starts to bother you, just sit still close your mouth because you don't want to swallow a wasp, stop talking so you're not breathing out carbon dioxide. And whatever you do, don't flail your arms around because if you start shouting at it and flailing your arms around, you are behaving like their primary predator, which are the badgers. Badgers will dig up wasp colonies and they're flailing around with their limbs and breathing heavily. And so wasps are simply responding to those cues if you behave like a badger. And last question, I ask this to every expert who comes on to try and prove why their field is first. If I throw you forward 30, 40, 50 years, what is one question you would really like to find the answer to in your study? What do you want to know about wasps that, as up to now, we've not quite grasped yet? Oh, gosh, there are so many. I think one of the things I'd really like society to work out about wasps is how to live well with wasps, how to live alongside wasps in the same way that we've learned to do with bees. So we have millennia long relationship with bees, particularly honeybees, but also stingless bees that we farmed for their products. And we use them as our pollinators. I think we have the same potential to do that for wasps in that we could learn to live alongside wasps to effectively farm them so that we can benefit from their predatory powers, from their pest control, such that the way that we use honeybees to pollinate our crops, we could be using wasps to help regulate insect populations in our for our crops. And that would bring us a step much further forward towards a much more sustainable environmental way of farming. Well, it's a brilliant case. Well fought, Dr. Sarian Sumner from University College London. All about wasps and we're getting into summer-ish. So hopefully that's just changed the way you think about them. Uh, Sarian, thank you so much for joining us. No worries. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much to Dr. Sarian Sumner. All about studying wasps. If you really enjoyed that and you want to find out more about wasps and why they're not always the mean monsters that we imagine they are and they provide a lot of help uh, across the world, Syrian has a brand new book out. Maybe you or someone in your family wants to read it. It's called Endless Forms, Why We Should Love Wasps. Uh, Let's hear about more biology now with another genius we love on the show, Marina Ventura. This is an episode from her series Inside Biology. She is our trusty explorer, getting up close with biology, what makes us, what makes things in the world around us. Uh, This time she's checking out how plants make seeds, and it all starts with pollen, which wasps and bees love. (laughs) 
Marina Ventura Inside Biology with the Society of Biology. Hold on tight. Hi again. We're checking out pollination today. That's what needs to happen for a plant to make a seed. And it all starts with, you guessed it, pollen. <laughs> pollen is definitely very good at getting up your nose if you have hay fever, but there's a lot more to it than that. Pollen are tiny dust-like particles produced by stamens in flowers. Stamens are the male parts of the flower. One flower can make over 7,000 particles of pollen, but only a few are needed to fertilize the female parts of the flower, called the stigma. But they have to get from stamen to stigma somehow, and that's called pollination. This grassy field is perfect for showing us one of the ways it's done. Some flowers, like these grasses, are pollinated by the wind. Look! We can see the tall, wispy stamens are just the right shape to catch the wind, blowing the pollen from stamen to stigma so the seeds can be made. Job done. And here's another way pollination can happen. Insects. They're attracted to the flowers by their scent and brightly coloured petals. As they dig around for the nectar and travel from flower to flower, pollen is carried on their bodies from stamen to the stigma. Again, a job well done. And you thought that all those nice smells and colours were for our benefit. I bet that MapApp can sniff out some more cool facts for us about pollination. Of course. The electronic essential for every explorer. Flowers are very choosy about what pollinates them and will put on a show to attract just the right creature. If a flower is best pollinated by bees and butterflies, it's likely to be very colourful with a strong smell. Mmm. Flowers that want to attract bats or moths are often white and so easier to see in the dark. They also tend to be scented more at night when their pollinators are active. But what about the stink cabbage or the dead horse arum lily? Like their name suggests, these unusual plants smell terrible. But that horrible pong is for good reason. These plants are pollinated by beetles that feed on dead or rotting matter and so need to smell just as whiffy to attract the beetles. Phew! I don't think you'd want to pick a bunch of those. Time for us to go, but we'll see you next time. In the meantime, find out more at funkidslive.com forward slash biology. Marina Ventura Inside Biology with the Society of Biology. Hold on tight. That's it for the Fun Kids Science Weekly this week. Three fantastic guests chatting about fossilised forests, dwarf stars and why wasps are much better than you might think. Uh, we will be back with more geniuses proving why their science is the best and answering your questions next week on the show. To do that, I need questions, right? So if you've got anything science that you want answered on the podcast, make sure you leave it as a voice note on the free Fun Kids app or at funkidslive.com. You heard a bit from Marina Ventura at the end there. You can hear more from her. And we've got loads more brilliant episodes of loads of series uh, on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your shows. They're on the free Fun Kids app too. And Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. Listen all over the country on our app, over on the website. And if you've got a smart speaker, wake it up and ask it to play Fun Kids. 